It is such a joy to be with you. We love your community. We love your relentless focus on those who don't know Jesus and welcoming them. And uh, we've been admirers of you guys for such a long time. And you were some of the folks who modeled to us what it meant to reach into our community. So thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. I love everything about your community. I love the young people, the kids. And we had this amazing celebration earlier and the kids were, they were so messy. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And it kind of made me think back to, you know, who your hero was when you were a kid. So why don't you turn to the person beside you and say either who your hero was or which superhero you would have liked to have been when you were a kid. So just take a moment. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, one of, the, one of the guys when I was growing up, one of the guys that was kind of well known in the 1980s, I'll sing you a couple of bars and you see if you can get, well I won't sing, I'll hum them. Who is it? Tom and Jerry, it's not Tom and Jerry. It's my singing, it's just particularly bad. Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones was just this exceptional, fearless individual. It didn't matter which environment or moment he was in in life, he displayed this relentless courage. And who can forget like that moment where he's there and he's looking into the unknown. If you missed this, you really should get the DVD on it. But he's looking into the unknown and he's standing like this. And even then, he's absolutely fearless. And most of us, most of us admire that kind of courage. On our best days, we aspire to that kind of courage. We imagine that we could possibly become these kind of risk-taking individuals. And yet the truth is, we find, despite our best efforts, our best intentions, we find fear encroaching in our hearts and creeping into our relationships. And we find that as much as we desire to be like our heroes, as much as we long that we could be more like Indiana Jones, we find ourselves kind of ambushed by fear along the way. And it seems like fear is becoming increasingly common everywhere you look in culture. People are becoming increasingly afraid. And uh, there's a few fears that we seem to be making up this weather. And if you were in the first service, I'm going to give you a pass on this quiz. But uh, here you go. Well, see if you know what this is. Ablutophobia. Anyone know what ablutophobia is? Fear of washing. You guys are so intelligent. This is the first church that's ever known what that is. I love that. I love that. Sorry, it's not that you're competitive, but it helps. Okay, here's one. I think I'm saying this right. Electrophobia. Electrophobia. No, but a great guess. No, fear of chickens. Some people are saying, yeah, I had that. I had that. I was going to text it in. Fear of chickens. Here's one. Pogonophobia. This is a particular bad month if you're pogonophobic. Beards. Were you in the first service? You're a genius. You're a genius. No one has ever, no one has ever come close to knowing what that is. Fear of beards. That's got to be awkward this month, isn't it? Everywhere you look. Like, ah! What about this one? Geniophobia. Gen geniophobia. Fear of denim, no. <laughs> but I see where you're going there, and I like that. <laughs> He's a smart man. God is going to use you. <laughs> Geniophobia. Fear of chins. That's got to be one of the most awful fears to have in life, isn't it? Every time you see someone with a chin, which is everyone, <laughs> you're afraid. Here's the last one. Pantherophobia. Anyone know what that is? Pantherophobia. Fear of the mother-in-law. <laughs> now, if your mother-in-law has a big chin and facial hair, you're in big, <laughs> big trouble if these fears are beginning to grip your laugh. 
And it seems like everywhere you look, people are increasingly afraid. And, and if we're going to reverse the climate of fear that's in our hearts and in our lives and in our culture and in our families, then we're going to need to have something called courage. And I loved the story. I, I didn't quite hear the beginning of it, but the guys related to me, Josh and Christy related to me. I loved the story of courage of those two young lads in their school this week. And if we're going to create a change in our culture, we're going to need to figure out how to summon our courage. Because those who carry a climate of courage in their heart create a climate of hope in the culture around them. There were some people, they were on a journey with God. They just come out of slavery in uh, Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18. If you want to put a finger in there, and uh, we're going to journey Joshua chapter 1 today. But it says this, when Pharaoh, who was the guy who was controlling and dominating their lives, when he let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, even though that was the shorter route. For God said, if they face war, if they go through difficulty or adversity or hostility, if they face war, they might change their minds and return back to slavery. They might change their minds and go back to Egypt. And so God led the people round by the desert road, taking the long way toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. And the Bible says, hey, they had every piece of equipment that they needed to face war. They went out ready for battle. But God said, let's take them a longer way because the reality is they don't yet have the courage that they need in their heart to come into everything that I have for them. And he takes them this longer route. And one of the things that God is looking for is that we would begin to become courageous people. That we would have this courage in our heart. Not a, not a fearlessness, but a courageousness that's willing to put ourselves in moments and environments that cost us something so that we can bring something to the community. And the mindset that you carry in your moments where you're surrounded by fear, the mindset that you step into, and that actually makes a huge difference in our communities. And so my question would be this, as we begin to delve in a little bit today, my question would be this. If God was to take the climate that's growing in your heart right now, the things that are growing in your heart, if he was to take it, and if he was to multiply that all over Cheltenham and Gloucester and some of the other smaller towns, if he was to take what's growing in your life and put it on every life in the community, would that be good news for the community? Would the community be living in less fear? Would it be living in greater hope? Would it have greater courage? If God was to take what's growing in your heart today and spill it out into everyone in this neighborhood and in this area, would that be good news? How do we become those kind of courageous people? God says, hey, these guys, they, they, they'll... If they're faced with trouble, if they're faced with heartache, if they're faced with difficulty, they'll just retreat back to what they've always known and they won't become who they long to become. And isn't that the truth when we look at young lives like Josh and Christy who were up earlier and we look at the kids in the earlier service, isn't it the truth that the reason that we didn't become what we hoped we might become in life is that somewhere along the line we got slightly disappointed and somewhere along the line we lost our courage just a little bit those moments when we could have pushed through, those moments where we could have made a different choice and we kind of lost our courage. And the great need of our community today is not brilliant people, it's courageous people. It's courageous people. And our culture knows this. This is why they'll say in news and in television programs and all that, the culture will say this, all that it takes for evil to prosper is that good people do nothing. And what they're saying is all that it takes for our cities to go into decline, all that it takes for things to spiral south, all that it takes is that people don't do anything, that they don't summon their courage and do something. We kind of get that intuitively, that if our culture is to change, sooner or later someone has to display courage. And whenever God is launching something like he is, I believe, with your church, whenever God is launching a movement of hope in a culture, he starts by calling the people towards courage. And we see this in Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 6. And I really feel this is so significant for you as a community. Um, and I've been emboldened to say that, really, because I didn't, I didn't set up this morning. But before you arrived this morning, there was a little child getting baptized, and his name was Joshua. And I felt that was a symbol for everything that God wanted to say to you. And I didn't set up the testimony in this service. But the kid giving the testimony, their name was Joshua. 
And I feel God is grabbing your attention. One, it's helpful for me. It's really useful. But I feel he really wants to grab your attention and say, listen up. I'm pouring something on you that your city needs, that your community needs. And he speaks to Joshua in this moment of transition. And aren't those the moments in life where you really need courage? When you are stepping into the unknown, when you're separating yourself from things that you've always done, always known, places you've always been, people you've always been with, and you're reaching for something that feels very unfamiliar, very uncertain, very fragile, and you're longing for clarity in it. That's what we always ask for. God, make it clear. And it's like heaven speaks back and says, you don't need clarity, you need courage. And so God speaks to Joshua. In Joshua 1, he says, be strong and courageous because you're going to lead these people to inherit the land. You're going to lead these people into life. I believe God would say to you as a community, be strong and courageous. You're going to bring life to this city. You're going to bring life to this community, but it's going to require courage. And every time that's a movement of God, it requires courage. It doesn't need lots of people with courage. One person with courage is enough to create a shift in the culture. One person with the courage to resist pornography so that kids can live in a climate of purity. One person with the courage to switch the computer off, to stop downloading the material. That one decision in that small corner of life where no one's looking, that one decision sets a different culture at the heart of our community. The courage in your office to stand up, to gossip, to refuse to engage with it. That one choice, that one moment that begins to help people breathe in thinking, gosh, I don't need to be slagging everyone else to get on in the workplace. There's a different environment. There's a different culture available. That choice, that courageous choice to work at our marriage when it's difficult and challenging. And yet through that courageous choice, it brings strength to society. The courage perhaps to, maybe you're here, maybe you've been coming for a while, maybe community is what community is. Community is both awkward and awesome and maybe you've been hurt in the past in relationships and you're afraid to put your heart in that vulnerable place again, but that courage today to take the slow walk to wherever it is you need to go and to sign up for one of these groups that are beginning on January the 5th, that takes courage. Small moments, the courage to walk across the room in your workplace and say to a friend there, you know, I've never told you this, and I don't know why, but the thing that's at the center of my life, the thing that makes sense of my life is I have a relationship with Jesus, and I'm so sorry that I've never told you this, and the courage to break your silence with your faith. All of those things are small moments that require enormous courage, and people with courage begin to reverse the climb at the heart of their community. And so God speaks to Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 6 and he says, be strong and courageous, Joshua. Be strong and courageous. And those are mere, more than mere words for Joshua. See, Joshua has been at a moment in life before where courage was required. And you remember the story, if you grew up in church, you may be familiar with this story, that God had intended that his people would inherit this land 40 years previously. And a couple of the guys who were journeying with God and journeying in faith, they had faith to believe that it was possible. But there were 10 other guys and they just didn't have courage. Their courage failed them. And so when Joshua's at this moment where God's saying, be strong and courageous, I think he's thinking to himself, I am not going to miss it this time. And the last time they missed it, because there were giants in the land, presumably giants with ginormous chins. <laughs> Maybe big hairy beards. And they missed it. And something about what they saw in those giants deterred them from their inheritance. And they said, we can't go there. We can't do this. We're like super inadequate, super insufficient. We can't do this. And Joshua, as God is speaking, be strong and courageous. I can imagine Joshua just nodding, thinking, yeah, I'm not going to miss it this time. I'm going to reach for it this time. I'm going to summon my courage. I'm going to take heart. In other words, what God is saying to Joshua is this. Joshua, make your heart a discouragement free zone. Make your heart a discouragement-free zone. For what I'm preparing for you, for what I'm doing in you, for what I'm releasing through you, you need your heart to be a discouragement-free zone. Joshua, be strong. Joshua, be courageous. Find a way to go through the things, Joshua, that would previously have disheartened you. Find a way to crash through the quitting points. Find a way to ensure that what's growing in your heart is an influence or affected by what's going on around you. Joshua, be strong and courageous. One of the things I love about this verse is it reminds me that courage is a choice. I don't have to be like Indiana Jones. I don't have to be born with it. 
Now, I'm not a particularly courageous person. I'm not built for courage. I'm not built for speed. I'm built for slipping through very slim doors. I'm not built for those things. And I love, I love that you don't have to have this in your genes, like naturally bold, naturally courageous person. But God says, hey, courage is an option. It's available to you. And courage is a choice. And if courage is a choice, discouragement is a choice. Did you know today that no one can make you discouraged? You have to choose discouragement. That events and moments can happen around your life. And of course, everyone's going to feel discouraged, right? I'm Scottish, which means I have never had a sporting victory to celebrate in my life. I I could be depressed every day of my life if I so choose. And people can't make you discouraged, but you can take discouragement just as surely as you can take courage. You can take discouragement. You can bring it in. It's a little bit like if you ever go shopping, I'm sure you do, and you go into a store, and the person in the store, you're there to buy whatever it is. Uh, You're uh, pushing in and and working that through, and the person at the the till is just, they're like, what do you want? You say, I'd I'd like the mints, please. They say, 80p. You think, oh, they seem a bit harsh and brusque in their manner and all of that. And then, and then they're just kind of rough in their treatment with you. And when you walk out the store with your friends, you're like, oh, they've really given me a bad attitude. I was happy before I went in there. I was whistling. And now I've come out and I've picked up their attitude. And the truth is, nobody can give you their attitude. You get to set the climate of your heart. If anything's growing in your heart today, it's because you let it grow. It's kind of hard to hear, isn't it? I wish that it wasn't true. I wish I could blame everyone else for the stuff that's growing in my heart. It'd be much more convenient. It's William Wallace's fault. <laughs> yeah, I, wish, I wish I could blame my family and my friend. I wish I could blame anyone. It's the government's fault. The truth is, the climate that's growing in my heart is the climate that I've chosen. And no one can discourage me. Discouragement is a choice. In order to dwell in discouragement, I have to intentionally ignore the goodness of God. I have to intentionally ignore the cross where Jesus disarmed the powers of the enemy and rules over them and reigns over them. And I have to also ignore his ability to deliver me. I have to walk into an environment and choose to allow that environment to get on top of me. If discouragement is going to reign in my life. And notice he doesn't say, hey, feel strong and courageous. Because that's just impossible. You won't always feel strong. You won't always feel courageous. No one is immune to discouragement. You just don't have to be discouraged. It's going to come. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, it's inevitable. There's no way around it. And he says this, but take heart or take courage. I've overcome the world. He says, take this truth into your heart. There's going to be all this going on around you. You're going to have all sorts of trouble, but take this truth into your heart. I've overcome the world. Now, I want to do just for a moment, a little bit of theology with you. Theology 101. Uh, Here it is. God is good. So I'm going to have you say this with me. Good God. God is good. God good. Let's try God good because it sounds better, doesn't it? God good. Devil bad. Yeah, that's, that's about as complex as life gets, really. If, you, if you've got that down, you're doing really well. You're doing really well. God good. God can only give me everything that's good because he's good. He's good. The devil is bad. He's bad. And he can only give me whatever's in his heart. So God can only give me out of his heart, which is good. And the devil can only give me out of his heart, which is bad. Yeah. Do you think the devil ever has a good day? He lives in constant discouragement. He once was this incredible angel at the throne of God. Getting to be in and around all that. Every day since that day has been a bad day for him. When I feel discouraged in my life, it's because he gave me it. The feeling. I get to choose whether I live in it and live under it and live under his voice. But when I feel that, it's because it comes from his heart. But here's what I've learned. The enemy spreads the atmosphere of his heart. But if I'm smart... I can actually use that discouragement to move forward. I can actually see his moments where he's sending discouragement my way 
as the opportunity to move forward in life. And I want to give you an example of this because the enemy will only attack you if you're moving. And once you realize that, it just helps. So here's the example. This little girl, her name is Malala. I may not get her name accurate. She was born in 1997. She's a Pakistani school pupil. It's from the town of Mingora in the Swat district of Pakistan. It's a Taliban-controlled environment. At age 11, she began writing a blog for, a B- for the BBC. She began to talk about the rights of girls to be educated in her culture. And she became a voice and a spokesperson for that in her community. And she began just to raise awareness in that. And in her community, girls aren't allowed to be educated or, or, or under Taliban rule. And so she began campaigning for that. And then one day, she's making her way home from school with some friends. They're in the school bus, and the Taliban invade the bus. And they ask, which one of you is Malala? You fast eye. And she says, or they look, they all look at her. And she says, it's me. And the Taliban come and they shoot her. And the reason they shoot her is because they're afraid of the difference that she's making. They were afraid that this one little 11 year old could change the whole culture. And they understood that what she was already doing was changing the culture. 11 years old, raising her voice in courage, and it was already emboldening everyone around her. 11 years old, 11, (laughs) one more. (laughs) Changing the whole culture so much that the fiercest fighters are sent to her to silence her. And the moment they walked on the bus and they shot her, you know the story, she ended up uh, being brought to hospital in the UK and miraculously she survived and now she's campaigning all across the world for the rights of children to be educated. She's saying, one child, one pen, one teacher changes the world. It's a message. It is utterly inspiring. But she won the moment they stepped onto the bus. That was the sign that what she was doing was already working. And when they did that to her, it just emboldened her all the more. And she thought, it's already working now. It's unstoppable. And so it's proven. This little courageous girl is beginning to shape so many people's lives. Because she stood up a little bit like Josh and Christy did in their school. What would happen if 11, 12-year-old kids all did what Josh and Christy did when they went to school? That would change Cheltenham for sure. Can you imagine it? Imagine all these guys just in school. It's like, hey, that would change things. And her story reminds us that the enemy is always attracted to movement in your life. You get discouraged because he's discouraged. He doesn't like what he sees growing in your heart and he wants to change it. And it's always been that way. And the Taliban were hoping with Malala that what they did would be enough to change her mind. But she wasn't like that first community we talked about earlier. Her mind was not for changing. She just continued to pursue. I think of where we are in culture right now. I think of a black president in America. I think that 50 years ago, there was one lady on a bus. People came onto the bus, it was different to Malala, they didn't put a gun to her head, they just said, you have no right to sit here, the color of your skin is the wrong color, move. And one lady summons her courage, because every other day she would have moved, but this day she won't move. This day she takes courage. This day she refuses to live under the voice of intimidation and fear. This day she's going to step out, and she's going to step out by remaining seated, and she stays seated. And Rosa Parks' story, the legend of it, just begins to reverberate around the community. And because of one person's courage, a few others begin to have courage. And they begin to say, we won't be moved. You won't be able to hide us away any longer. You won't be able to pretend that we're inferior to you any longer. You won't be able to dictate where we can sit, and where, where we can go to the toilet, where we can spend time with our families. We refuse any longer to be moved. And they began singing those songs, we shall not be moved. And after a while, as more joined the movement of courage, they began singing a different song. And it had gone from we shall not be moved, which is this defensive posture, to we shall overcome. And all across the communities and all across the US, communities were now summoning their courage. 
And then you have these amazing pictures, these amazing scenes, don't you, where they would be marching somewhere and police would come and dogs would come and all of that and they would smash into them and the dogs would savage them and all of that. And you have this picture of people using everything that the enemy was bringing their way and using it to advance still further. Understanding that no matter how much the enemy threw at them, things were changing. And the sign that things were changing was how angry the enemy was by what they were doing. And it's courage. And it begins to take root in one heart. It begins to take root in one life. It doesn't always look like a massive thing. Sitting in a bus is not a massive thing. Spending time with your kids is not a massive thing. It doesn't look earth shattering to the world around us. But the courage to do those things, the courage to leave work early, come home to your family, that's a small moment that changes your world. The courage to get down on your knees and pray, it's a small moment that changes your world. The courage, the courage to stay invested in relationships when you've been disappointed, it's a small moment that changes your world. And God today is looking for courageous people who will take their everyday ordinary moments and surrender them to him. And if he finds it, he'll begin to change culture all around them. And so I believe that's what Jesus brought me here to tell you this morning. That this is your time. That this is your moment. That this is the time for you to step out in courage. That he's put today in your minds and your heart and before your eyes, he's made it Joshua Day. He's made it days when Joshua's were baptized and Joshua's told their stories and we read Joshua's story from the scripture. And he's saying to you as a church, I want to give you more. I want to bring you into the inheritance that I have for you. But right now, there's some things going in your heart and I want to give you courage and I want to invite you to take courage. Would you stand with me?